Let's compare government spending versus taxation. So which one is better? Is it better to cut government spending or to raise taxes? Is it better to increase government spending or to lower taxes? So how, how do these compare when we're making decisions about fiscal policy? So let's look first at government spending. Well, if government, when we look at government spending, what we find is government spending actually has a greater impact on the economy than a tax cut of the same amount. So if you cut taxes, for example, by $100, or if you have the government spend $100, the government spending $100 would have a greater increase on real GDP, on the size of the economy. And in fact, you're going to prove this uh, in the class assignment. But it really has to do with that spending multiplier, that ripple effect. So let's suppose you had a spending multiplier of two. So what would that mean? That would mean that if the government spent a dollar, that the economy would grow two times that, so two dollars. So where does that come from? Well, the first dollar is the government spending, growing the economy. Increased government spending increases aggregate demand. But then you have the fact that the government is spending, and when the government spends, they are creating jobs, which puts income in people's pockets, which they, which they then spend. And so because it puts income in people's pocket, they spend, puts income in someone else's pocket, they spend, there's an additional dollar spent in the economy if the spending multiplier is two. So it has this ripple effect. Now, if we do a tax cut, then if we cut taxes, then that means more money in your pocket, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you spend it you could, for example, put it into your savings account. In which case, it doesn't go to buy goods, which creates jobs and puts income in people's pocket, which they then use to buy goods, and so on. So it's really about that first part of the spending multiplier, that initial government spending creating jobs is where that greater impact is coming from. With a tax cut, since we don't have that first part, we just have more money in your pocket, you're not necessarily going to be spending as much of it, and it doesn't have as big of a multiplicative effect. And you're going to look at that in uh, more detail in the assignment that you're working on. The other thing we have to look at when it comes to government spending is that government spending can be very focused, so we can target it on specific areas of the economy that have high unemployment. So the government can choose to create jobs within a particular province, or within a particular area of a province, particular city, by focusing its spending. Taxes don't have that same targeted effect. They are much more widespread, um, and so it's impacting the greater economy as a whole. Now, when it comes to tax cuts, tax cuts are viewed more favorably by the public. So we like tax cuts because it impacts everybody, right? We all get to save a bit of money. Whereas government spending, because it can be targeted, we may not benefit from. So the government might decide to help stimulate the economy in a different province or area than we live in, and that's our money they're using to do it, but we may not feel the impact. Whereas tax cuts, because they can't be targeted, they're going to impact us. So we tend to like them better just because we're more likely to be impacted by it. When we look at tax cuts, tax cuts can be implemented for a short period of time. Most of the time when we create tax cuts, we have a sunset clause in the tax law, which says after a certain amount of time, the tax cut expires, the tax credit expires, or whatever it is that is um, reducing um, our tax burden. And so it just expires after a period of time and then goes back up. In which case, it's a lot easier to raise taxes than it is to decrease government spending. When you decrease government spending, the people who are being impacted by that government spending aren't very happy. And because the people who are changing that government spending 
our elected officials, they're very hesitant to reverse any government spending. Because the last thing you want to do is have the government not spend as much money on your area, and then you get blamed and you don't get reelected. So it's difficult to reverse government spending, to take away money the government has been giving. It's way easier to increase taxes by simply letting those tax cuts that you created, letting them expire. Tax changes can actually be implemented faster than government spending. It's quite surprising because our taxes, we only pay, uh, we pay our income taxes once a year. Uh, sales taxes can be changed quicker than that. But even with paying our income tax once a year, it's actually faster to change taxes than it is to change government spending. So let's look at why that is. So both taxes and government spending suffer from lags, but government spending suffers from a lot more lags than taxes. So let's suppose that we're in a recession. Okay. Well, initially, you don't even know you're in a recession. In fact, it takes six months to even know you're in a recession. So economy starts to contract. It takes six months for us to figure out that we're actually in a recession. So between the economy actually starting to contract and the time we know it, that's six months later. So there's a recognition lag. This is the time before a problem is recognized. Okay, so we've identified that we're in a recession. We need to do something about it. So we have lots of debate as to what the best approach is for this. So let's say that we've decided that we're going to use government spending on building schools. Okay, decision is made. So it took a while between when the fact we realized that we had a recession to exactly what we're going to do about it, and that's the decision lag, the time between recognition and making a decision to act. So now we need to go about implementing our decision uh, to build more schools. So we have to put out a call for bids and the private sector then is going to put together their bids and submit them. And since it's public dollars, we often require at least three bids, and we have to then decide from those companies which one is actually going to build the schools for us. So there's an implementation lag, a lag between the decision to act and actual implementation, draw up the plans, award the contracts, etc. All right, we start building the school. Decision is implemented. Now it takes a while to build the school. And while we're building that school, we're paying people income to do the building. But it's going to take a while before they have enough income in their pocket for them to start going out and eating out more, traveling, and spending that money. So it takes a while before it actually has an impact on the economy before that government spending actually increases demand and stimulates the economy. So this is the impact lag or also called the effect lag. For the time it takes from when you implement your decision, we start building the schools, to when it starts to impact the economy. So in fact, between when the problem arises, that is, we start having economy contract and our policy starts to actually change the economy, this is a considerable amount of time. In fact, this can be such a long time that by the time that the actual policy has any impact on the economy, the recession's already over. And now you're simply pushing the economy in the direction it's already going. If you're pushing the economy in the direction it's already going, then this is what is called a pro-cyclical effect. Well, the problem with pushing the economy in the direction that's already going is you're no longer fixing the recession, 
you're now stimulating an economy that's already stimulated, and so you can actually create inflation by driving the economy up even more. So we have to recognize that with fiscal policy, it takes a long time, and it can take such a long time that the original reason you had made the decision is no longer at issue anymore. There are other limitations to fiscal policy besides lags. Okay. We talked about one a little bit already, which is making a decision as to um, what government spending you would cut and how, as a politician, you don't want to be the one to cut government spending for your constituents. Because if you cut government funding to the people who vote for you, well, then they won't vote for you anymore and you'll be out of office. So it can be very difficult to get politicians to cut spending and to raise taxes. Okay, what taxes would you raise? And so because all these people are voted into office, it's easy to make government spending go down. I'm sorry, it's easy. Let's try that again. It's easy to make government spending go up and taxes go down, but it's very hard to go the other direction. Making government spending go down and taxes go up, nobody wants to be the one that will do that, which is what has gotten uh, Canada, the U.S., and many countries into the position we are now. That is, we keep having deficits year after year after year because everybody runs on the idea of lower taxes or the government helping out those in need but nobody wants to pull back and increase tax revenue to support uh, the increase in government spending in the past. And so it can be very hard uh, to use fiscal policy um, to slow down the economy. Another challenge with fiscal policy is the fact that both the federal, provincial, and municipal governments get to do it. When it comes to fiscal policy, you'd like to think that the state, the um, province, the city, the federal government, that they're all trying to stimulate the economy in the same way. But this is not always the case. So we look at, for example, the 2008-2009 recession. The federal government is trying to stimulate the economy by increasing government spending and lowering taxes. But many of the provinces in Canada have a balanced budget requirement. That is, they cannot have deficits year after year after year. So Alberta, for example, used to have a balanced budget requirement and we got rid of it. Uh, but other provinces still have it. So we look at Saskatchewan, for example, and if they're trying to balance the budget, at the same time, the federal government is trying to stimulate the economy. Well, if the economy is contracting and income is going down, then people are paying less in taxes. So in order for the province to balance the budget, they're having to raise the tax rate okay, or cut back on government spending to help balance the budget. And this is at the same time that you have the federal government trying to stimulate the economy by increasing government spending and lowering taxes. Well, then the two just cancel each other out because if the province is raising taxes and the federal government's lowering taxes, then they ultimately have no impact. In the 2008-2009 recession, Nova Scotia, who had a balanced budget requirement, they raised their provincial sales tax to 15 percent. Well, if you're raising your sales tax at the same time the economy is struggling, then that's not going to help your economy. And the federal government was trying to stimulate the economy, but the Nova Scotia government had to balance the budget with less tax revenue because of lower income, and so they simply canceled each other out. Okay. So when you have fiscal policy between by the federal, provincial, and municipal governments, you need them to be going the same direction. They all need to be stimulating the economy, or they all need to be slowing the economy down. You can't have one slowing it down while the other one's trying to speed it up.
And the challenge with balanced budget mandates is that when the economy is contracting, that's the time that you have to increase taxes and lower government spending, which is the opposite of stimulating the economy. On the other hand, if you don't balance the budget, then debt creates a huge amount of problems. So let's look at the problem that debt creates. So when you have expansionary fiscal policy, government spending goes up, taxes go down, which means we create deficit spending. We have a budget deficit. Well, if you're using expansionary fiscal policy year after year after year, then you're adding to the national debt. So let's look at our national debt. Where did it come from? And what impact does it have on the economy? 